It's my pleasure to welcome to the stage, sitting next to me, the Honorable Henrietta Davis, Mayor of the City of Cambridge. <clears throat> And I'm privileged to welcome to these exercises our 50th reunion class. Please join me in a salute to the class of 63. It is now my honor to introduce our commencement speaker, MIT alumnus and co-founder and CEO of the online file sharing phenomenon known as Dropbox, Drew Houston. In 2005, Drew was sitting where you are sitting he earned his bachelor's degree from MIT in electrical engineering and computer science. Within months, he had, <laughs> he had experienced, familiar to many graduates of MIT, he became so exasperated with the current state of technology that he invented a solution that would change the world. Drew was frustrated with the cumbersome process of having email files having to be sent to himself in order to work on those same files from multiple computers. So he invented and later perfected a revolutionary answer, a technology that allows users to unite all of their documents, photographs, and videos for all of their devices, to gain access to them, to share them with others, anytime, anywhere. In 2007, just two years after graduation, he turned this idea into an ambitious startup called Dropbox, and for many in the audience and for 100 million people around the world, to Dropbox has already become a verb and an everyday necessity. When Drew sought funding from a California venture capital firm, they insisted that he find a partner and a co-founder. So he came straight back to MIT, and Drew brought with him today uh, as a co-founder and chief technology, Arash Ferdowsi. <clears throat> Drew says that he learned fundamental management level lessons from living and helping to run his fraternity the MIT chapter of the Phi Delta Theta. The House has a number of other famous alums, including a Nobel laureate, and that fact probably makes Phi Delta Theta the only living group at MIT that can boast both a Nobel Prize and a four-year-old company that is valued at many billions of dollars. I would urge the rest of you to use this as an example and keep trying. Ladies and gentlemen, Drew Houston. Thank you, Chairman Reed. Uh, you're going to hear this a lot today, but I feel so lucky to be the first to say it. Congratulations to all of you in the class of 2013. And uh, you should be so proud of yourselves. Uh, it's really great to be back, and it's such an honor to be here today. Um, I still wear my brass rat every day, and uh, turning this ring around on graduation is still one of the proudest moments of my life, and you guys know what turning around the beaver means. So there are a lot of reasons why this is a special day, but the reason that I'm so excited for all of you is that today's the first day of your life where you no longer need to be checking boxes. Right? For the first couple decades, it's all about jumping through hoops, you know, get these test scores, get into this college, take these classes, get this degree, you know, pay your dues and get to work. All of that ends today. Thank God. Um, the hard thing about planning your life is you have no idea where you're going, 
but you want to get there as soon as possible. And people here are going to tell you, like, oh, maybe you'll start a company, or maybe you'll cure cancer, or you know, maybe you'll write the next great American novel. Um, and you're probably thinking, or oh, I don't know, maybe things will go horribly wrong. Uh, I had no idea when I was graduating. And, and in fact, not too many years ago, I was sitting right over there. Um, it, it was raining on my graduation, too. It's OK. Um, <laughs> and being up here now in robes and speaking to all of you, was uh, not exactly part of my plan. And in fact, I've never really had a grand plan. And, and now I realize that it's probably not possible to have a grand plan when you're graduating, if ever. And I've thought a lot about what's different about the life that all of you are beginning today. And I've thought a lot about, you know, if I had to go back to 2006 um, and start it all over again, what would I do? And what got you here is basically being smart and working hard. But nobody tells you that today the recipe for success changes. And so what I want to do is give you guys a little cheat sheet, the one that I would have loved to have on my graduation day. And if you were to look at my cheat sheet, there wouldn't be that much on it. There would be a tennis ball, there would be a circle, and there would be the number 30,000. Now, I know none of that makes sense right now, but let's roll with it. All right, so. I started my first company when I was 21. I was born in a Chili's. Yeah. And uh, my co-founder, Andrew Crick, and I had never done this before. So you know, we, we think starting a company is a big deal. We're like, well, do you need to wear a suit to City Hall, or do we need to go get like, a seal so we can stamp all of our important documents? And it turns out you can just go online and fill out a form, and you're done in like two minutes. So. It was a little anticlimactic, but we were in business and you know, our, got our onion strings. And we decided that our company was going to make a new kind of online course for the SAT. And most kids back then were using these old school like 800 page books. And the other online courses weren't very good. So we thought this was great. Uh, we brushed off our SAT vocab and we called it accolade, which means uh, an, an honor uh, or an award. And uh, well, actually, we didn't call it Accolade. We called it the Accolade Group LLC because we thought that sounded much more impressive. <laughs> so it was great. You know, I stop at Staples on the way home, and I get some cardstock. And, and if any of you ever start a company someday, you'll realize that the first order of business is first you Photoshop a logo, and then you print out a bunch of business cards that say founder on them. And the next thing you do is you hand them out at conferences. And you practice telling girls, well, why, yes, I, I do have a company. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> but actually, the best part was learning all kinds of new things. So I lived in my fraternity house every summer. And up on the fifth floor, there's a room with a ladder that goes up to the roof. And I had this nylon green folding chair. And I bought all these books off of Amazon. And every, week, every weekend, I'd, gra I'd drag all that stuff up to the roof. And I'd read about all these new things, about sales, about marketing, about strategy, uh, management, all these things I knew nothing about. And so it wasn't exactly my plan to get my MBA on the roof of Phi Delta Theta. But that's kind of what happened. So it was all good for a while. But a couple of years later, things started going downhill. And it just felt like it was, got harder and harder to get things done. And, and at some point, something in me just snapped. I'm like, my god, I, I just can't deal with any more math questions about like parallel lines or isosceles triangles or like the two trains leaving Memphis at 345. Um, and of course, I'm like, oh, god, there's something wrong with me. And I felt guilty because I was unproductive. And you know, starting a company had been my dream for a long time. And so I remember this moment where I thought, well, maybe I don't have what it takes after all. So I took a little break. So I, I don't know if any of you guys studied Core 6. But, uh, but I studied Core 6, computer science. And if you're in Core 6, sometimes taking a break means writing a poker bot. And if you haven't played poker online before, basically what happens is you sit for hours and you're clicking buttons, and then you lose all your money. And so all a poker bot does is it lets your computer lose all of your money for you, which is what I did. Um, 
but I was like fascinated. I was like possessed. I was like, I just couldn't stop thinking about this thing. I would think about it in the shower. I'd think about it, you know, waking up in the middle of the night. And um, it was like the switch went on and I was a machine. Uh, and then I remember in the middle of all this, uh, one weekend, mom and dad wanted all of us to go up to New Hampshire to have this family weekend together. And I was thinking, okay, well, but I don't want to stop working on my poker bot. So I pull up in my cord, and I get out, and I you know, say, hi, mom, and then I open the trunk. And next, I'm dragging like 100 pounds of all my computer stuff and all these wires into our little cottage on the lake. And I go inside, and I look. I'm like, oh, the dining room table's not big enough. So I start rearranging stuff on the stove, like moving the pots and pans around to make room for all my monitors. And my mom comes in. She's like, what the hell are you doing? Well, actually, she was just convinced that I was going to jail. Um, and actually, I'm going to take a second uh, really quick. So actually, I put my mom and dad through a lot. And I'm sure all of us here put our parents through a lot. And so I just, let's all just take a second to thank them, our moms, dads, families, everyone we love who got us here. Thank you. All right, so, so I was going to say work on what you love. But that's actually not that helpful, right? It's so easy to convince yourself or rationalize that you love what you do. But when I think about it, the happiest and most successful people that I know, they're not just in love with what they do. They're obsessed. And they're not just obsessed, but they're obsessed with solving an important problem, something that really matters to them. I had like dogs growing up. I don't know if you've ever thrown a tennis ball for a dog. But like, you don't even have to like, you just, you don't have to throw it, you lift it up and like the dog gets these like crazy eyes. And then you throw it and like the leash snaps and they go bounding off and they're like plowing through, you know, whatever's in their way to get it. That's what my friends feel like. <laughs> and that's what I hope all of you find because I have other friends too who work hard and they're paid well in their jobs, but they complain and they feel like they're like shackled to a desk. So the problem is, a lot of people don't find their tennis ball right away. You know, even for me, you know, don't get me wrong, I love the SAT. You know, I, I love me a good standardized test as much as the next guy. <laughs> but like, being king of SAT prep, like I'm not sure what kind of hat you get for that. But, uh, but that wasn't going to be my tennis ball. And so what scares me is that both Dropbox and this poker bot started out as distractions. Like that little voice in my head was telling me what to do all along, and the whole time I'm telling it to shut up so I can get back to work. Like I almost missed it. But sometimes that little voice knows best. So it took me a while to get it, but I realized the reason why the, the people that work the hardest don't work hard because they're disciplined. They, they work hard because solving and working on an exciting problem is fun. So after today, after today, it's not just about pushing yourself. It's about finding your tennis ball. It's about finding the thing that pulls you. It might take a while, but until you find it, keep looking and keep an ear out for that little voice. All right, let's go back to the summer after my graduation, the one all of you are about to have. So one of my best friends and fraternity brothers, this guy Adam Smith, started a company with his friend Matt Brezina. And I was excited, and we all got together, and we decided, well, hey, why don't we all work together out of, an, out of the same apartment? So we could, it, it'll, we'll save some money, it'll be fun. And it was perfect. It was a perfect summer. Well, it was almost perfect. Like, uh, the air conditioning was broken, so we were all, like, coding in our boxers. So, uh, but it was pretty good. So Adam and Matt were working, like, every waking hour. And, but as time went on, they kept getting pulled away. And I'd be like, well, where are you guys going? And they're like, well, we're going to meet with another investor. And I'm like, oh, OK. And one of these investors actually took him on a helicopter ride. And I'm like, I mean, at this point, I was like, OK. Like, seriously, like, I've been working on my company for like two years. And Adam's only been at it for like two months. I'm like, I, I don't want a helicopter ride. <laughs> and but that was just the beginning. Like, things only got worse. Like, August rolled around, and Adam gave me the bad news that they were moving out. And so not only were they moving out, 
but they were off to Silicon Valley where the real action was happening, and I was getting left behind. I mean, it was okay. Like every now and then, I would call Adam to see how things were going. And things were always pretty good. So I remember one afternoon, I called him and he's like, oh, we met with Vinod today. And, and I knew that Vinod, Vinod Kosala, he's this legendary Silicon Valley investor, entrepreneur, this billionaire. And I was like, oh, that's cool, what do you say? And then Adam was like, he's going to give us $5 million to get started. And so, I mean, I was thrilled for Adam, but this, this was a shock for me. Because, like, you know, here's Adam, he's, he's my little brother in the fraternity, and he's like my beer pong partner. <laughs> he's two years younger than me. I'm like, I'm out of excuses. Like, Adam is off to the Super Bowl, and I'm not even getting drafted. And, you know, Adam had no idea at the time, but he actually gave me just the kick that I needed. It was time for a change. So they say that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So like, think about that for a second. Like, who would be in your circle of five? And I have some good news. MIT is one of the best places in the world to start building that circle. Because if I hadn't come here, I never would have met Adam. I never would have met my amazing co-founder, Arash. And there would be no Dropbox. One thing I've learned is that surrounding yourself with people who inspire you is now just as important as being talented or working hard. Can you like, imagine if Michael Jordan hadn't been in the NBA? Like if, if his circle of five were like a bunch of guys in Italy or something? Like, I don't think we'd be seeing him on Wheaties boxes. And so that's, that's the point. Like your circle pushes you to be better, just like Adam pushed me. And now your circle's going to grow to include your coworkers and the people around you where you live. And where you live matters. There's only one MIT, and there's only one Hollywood, and there's only one Silicon Valley. And this isn't a coincidence. For whatever you're doing, there's one place in the world where the best people go, and you should go there. Don't settle for anywhere else. Like Being able to meet my heroes and learn from them gave me a huge advantage. So your heroes are part of your circle, too. So follow them. All right. The last trap you might fall into after school is this idea of like getting ready. Right? Don't get me wrong. Learning is still your top priority. It's the most important thing you can do. But the way you do it changes. From now on, the fastest way to learn is by doing. You know, otherwise, if you have a dream, you can spend a lifetime planning for it and studying for it and getting ready for it. But what you should be doing is getting started. Honestly, I don't think I've ever been ready. I remember right after we moved to San Francisco, uh, I remember the day that our investors said, yes, we want to invest. Where do we send the money? And so for a 24-year-old, this is like Christmas. Right? And opening your present is like running over to your computer on Monday morning and refreshing bankofamerica.com. And watching your company's checking account go from like $60 to $1.2 million. And I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. Like That number has two commas in it. <laughs> And then I was like, then something happened. I just got this feeling in the pit of my stomach. I'm like, wait a minute. Like, someday these guys are going like, to come looking for this. Right? What the hell have I gotten myself into? And you guys all know this feeling. At MIT, we call it drinking from the fire hose. And it's about as fun as it sounds, and, and we got the internal bleeding to prove it. But uh, we've also learned that it's good for you. And today, one valve shuts off, and now your job is to go out and find a new fire hose. And for me, that's been Dropbox. As you might expect, building this company has been the most exciting and interesting and fulfilling experience of my life. But what you probably don't know, and what I haven't really talked about, is this has also been the most painful and humiliating and frustrating experience, too. And I look back over the years, and I, I can't even count the number of things that have gone wrong. And fortunately, it doesn't matter. That's the thing. Nobody has a 5-0 in real life. Actually, now that you're done with school, the whole idea of a GPA just goes away. Bill Gates' first company made software for traffic lights. Okay, Steve Jobs' first company made plastic whistles 
that, uh, let you make you f that allowed you to make free phone calls. Neither of these companies were successful, but I, and it's hard to imagine that these guys were too worried about it. That's my favorite thing about what changes today. From now on, failure doesn't matter. You only have to be right once. I feel like I used to worry about all kinds of things, but I can remember the moment where I calmed down and got over it. So I just moved to San Francisco, and one night I couldn't sleep, so I'm on my laptop and I'm just on the internet. And I run into this page and I read, there are 30,000 days in your life. And at first I'm like, yeah, whatever, obviously. But then I was like, huh. And I remember I tabbed into the calculator and I typed in, I'm like 24 times 365. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm like 9,000 days down. Like, what the hell have I been doing? And by the way, you guys are 8,000 days down. So that's how 30,000 ended up on the cheat sheet. That night, I realized there were no warm-ups, there's no practice rounds, there's no reset buttons. Every day, we're writing a few more words of a story. And from then on, well, actually, when you die, it's not like, here lies Drew, he came in 174th place. You know, and from then on, I decided that, okay, instead of trying to make my life perfect, I want to make it interesting. I want my story to be an adventure. And that's made all the difference. So my grandmother's here today. Next week, we'll be celebrating her 95th birthday, and I love her very much. And, and, and we talk on the phone more often now that I'm on the West Coast, but one thing that's always stuck with me is she always ends our phone calls with the same one word, excelsior, meaning ever, meaning ever upward. And now on your, today, on your commencement, your first day of life in the real world, that's what I wish for you. Instead of trying to make your life perfect, give, your, the, give yourself the freedom to make it an adventure and go ever upward. Thank you. <laughs>